The Pan-African Parliament descended into chaos for a number of days now, with ANC Chief Whip Pemima Jodina being physically assaulted. The organ of the African Union is intended to involve all member states in discussions and decision-making processes. Now, some analysts say what is at the heart of the tensions is divisions between African nations and mostly along past colonial lines. Well, let's unpack what's been unfolding there. The University of South Africa's law professor, Baba Tunjo Fagbayibo, and senior researcher at the Institute for Global Dialogue, Faith Mabera, uh, joined me tonight. Good evening to both of you, uh, and thank you so much for your time. Professor Babatunda, let's firstly be begin with the legitimacy of the Pan-African Parliament right now. Um, number one, they don't have full legislative powers. They seem to have very little accountability when it comes to the actual functions of the institution. Can they still be regarded as a legitimate body? Um, uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, to I think when when we ask um, uh, questions about legitimacy, I think it's also better for us to to kind of situate it within uh, um, certain narratives or certain you know additional context of of regionalism in Africa. Um, does the African uh, Pan African Parliament of legitimacy? You see, the the, the issue is that <laughs> the the swing, you know, the 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 threshold of legitimacy shifts. Um, it is, I mean, it was created obviously to be the voice of, you know, voice of um, civil society and voice of Africans. That is in the context of um, of, of of regional integration and. It does not have enough powers, but when you also look at some of um, the actions, even within the Pan-African Parliament, the way it has, you know, been able to, even with little or no powers that it has, the way it's been able to um, to engage in advocacy issues around issues of peace and security on the continent, around issues of human rights, and and all of those things. One could say that it is an organization that has potential, and it is a, it is an organization that understands its role within the continental integration process. Um, it currently has diminished legitimacy, no doubt about that. Um, and that's part of, in fact, that's the fulcrum of, 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 of the issue now, saying how do we boost or enhance its legitimacy. So I will not go to the extent of saying it has zero legitimacy. Um, yes, it has significantly diminished legitimacy, but the question now is how do we boost that legitimacy. I don't think it's um, it's a lost case. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't I don't believe that. Faith, how can we understand um, the conflict, the tensions that have been playing themselves out over the last couple of days? Thank you, and good evening to the viewers. I think at the heart of the dispute is the question, um, I would say, of precedent on one hand versus procedure on the other. So there's this issue of the Southern. Uh, caucus is pushing for the the uh, precedence of the rotational principle or the principle of the rotational um, regional rotational in terms of that principle also being a key factor in other AU organs. While on the other hand, you have this this other, other caucus, mostly the Western um, African caucus, that is resisting this this notion and calling more for the, the question of precedent, mm. by which they argue that they've been conducting elections by a simple majority. So that's the, the heart of the, the, the contention at the moment. That's the bone of contention. But also, interestingly, um, especially we follow, I think, for the past two days, there's been uh, an issue raised about a letter having or a legal opinion having been sent from the Office of Legal Counsel of the AU. And this is also what has been at dispute today, because um, in, an, in a second attempt to try and vote today, you had some members arguing that um, a legal opinion does not hold and that um, the question of regional rotation, for instance, is not at play in this, in this mm. uh, uh, instance because there's partial ratification of the so-called Malabo Protocol, the 2015 Malabo Protocol, which has only been um, um, signed or, or, or the instruments of ratification have, have only been uh, deposited by 12 states and yet the requ requisite number is 28. So that's still um, pending and hanging up in the air. Now what's interesting about the Malabo Protocol, I actually revisited Article 12 of the Malabo Protocol today just to see. And it's interesting because if you read Article 12 of the protocol, it says that 
in terms of the bureau of the the PAP, which is the, the, the I would say the the main oversight body of the PAP, they're the ones who dictate the procedural matters, oversee the oversight, essentially the overseers of the PAP. According to Article uh, 12 of this protocol, the the election of this bureau should actually be uh, by regional rotation. So there is argument from the South and Caucasus that essentially the principle should trickle down to the election of the chair, which I, I, I can totally see. But then you have this contention. And this is a matter that hasn't been settled mm -hmm. on a legal basis per se. So it's a question of um, what should come or what direct directorate should come from the AU uh, Commission as the custodian of the AU Constitutive Act um, in this matter particularly. Professor Babatunde, why do you believe there's been so much opposition uh, to this idea of the rotational leadership? Um, this is, you know, this, this is continental politics at play. Um, and I know there's been a lot of arguments around, you know, this division between Francophone uh, and Anglophone Africa. But it's, um, it also goes back to the game of numbers. I mean, uh, the West Central African Caucus understands the fact that if they were to, you know, jettison the rotational, you know, kind of the, uh, election, and go for the simple majority, there's a likelihood that they will hold on to power. So it's power play. It's power play. Um, power politics, or people who actually handle the, the, the issue of politics at the Pan-African level, at the, at the continental integration level, understand that, of course, Pan-African parliament does not have significant powers. It cannot make laws, but there's still some influence. Um, there's, there's a way in which it portrays itself, in which it projects itself as, as a significant power player and significant power blocks also see this and they use this as an instrument of also enhancing their own domestic political agenda, um, so to speak. So uh, the idea of holding on to power and saying, perhaps let's just do the simple majority because they understand it's a game of numbers, they understand it's a game they've been playing for, you know, for, 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 for some time now. Um, and of course, um, to, 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 to boost um, their, you know, their power base. But um, I think um, to, to just build on what um, Faith had, had, had said earlier about, um, you know, the legal opinion uh, at the Pan-African level, we, we also have to understand that the, we're beginning to see the lacuna, the gaps in terms of institutional development in the African Union. And what do I mean by this? Um, the, the, the African Court of Justice, so the, you know, the, the judicial organ of the, of, um, of the AU right. should actually comp be composed of the African Court of the Emerged Court, African Court of Justice and the Human Rights Section, ACG and HR. But um, because member states have not ratified that merged um, the major protocol, all we have now is the African Court of Human and People's Rights. And if you look at one of the functions or one of the object or one of the powers or mandates of the African Court of Justice section is to handle cases like this. Now, um, if we had the African Court of Justice today, this issue would have been taken to the African Court of Justice mm -hmm. and the judges would have been able to give a binding opinion on how to, um, to, to go about this. And I mean, I can say, um, here, I can put my head on the block to say if this case had gone to the African Court of Justice, it would have been interpreted contextually in the sense that the African Court of Justice would have said, yes, we understand that there's discrepancies of there's, you know, kind of, you know, not maybe not discrepancies, but kind of, um, you know, um, you know, differences of opinion about whether it should be rotational or whether it should be by simple majority direct elections. But if we look at the contextual ideational or the contextual idea of, of regionalism now, we understand that the uh, Pan-African Parliament cannot exist in isolation of the, the, the idea of regionalism or the idea of continental integration. And when we look at it holistically, it actually bends towards having rotational presidency because that's what obtains in other parts of them, um, in, in other organs of the African Union. And even in the African Union, then, you know, even when you look at the African Union Commission in the elections and all of those things, this is what obtains rotational so that you have this inclusion and, uh, and so that all regions actually feel that they're part of, of the continental integration process. So that might have been, been handled, but we don't have it now, so we're just making guesses here about what would have happened. Um, uh, and 
of course, they would, um, the, the, the argument will be, if we look at it from a legalistic point of view, the Malabo protocol is yet to come into force, then perhaps we cannot start implementing um, um, issues that have not become um, um, norms. Uh, at the African Union level. Uh, Faith, let me wrap up with you very briefly for me. There are those who make the argument about and question why this issue is being brought up now, the issue of rotational leadership, and why it hasn't been previously ventilated. Um, it's, it's, I think it, the timing also coincides with the end of term of the current or the incumbent president who has served um, his, his two-year limit. And... Uh, two term limit, sorry. And this this has raised, um, I think there was certain quarters where there was a lot of grievances about how he ran, um, his, he ran his post as, as president. So this has, I think, resurfaced a lot of grievances, uh, but particularly interesting among some of his previous supporters in the first election, they said that he had promised that um, the, the forthcoming election would be run under the principle of regional rotation. So it's like they're coming to collect uh, their debt on this particular issue. But it's, it has been a long-standing issue in the PAP. I think it's only surfacing now because of, of the scene we've seen before us. But another issue that's also likely to come up in a few years is the issue of representation, particularly the gender representation requirement as outlined by the Malaba Protocol. So that's another potential um, um, explosive issue that might also be become another stumbling block um, in the PAP's um, sort of work and procedures uh, going forward. All right, let's leave it there for tonight. Let me thank you both for your time on News at Prime. Professor and Law at the University of South Africa, that's Professor Babatunde Fagbayibo and Faith Mabera from the Institute for Global Dialogue.